Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insight straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions. Regardless of whether you will apply to a particular school being highlighted, you should listen to all of the episodes as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process, prompting you to come up with your own follow-up questions for when you visit campus or meet with a college admissions representative yourself. Lastly, if you have any questions you'd like me to cover on future episodes or any comments you'd like to share, please email me at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit our website at www.collegeadmissionstalk.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today Lance Lede, who's an admissions counselor at Williams College. Lance, so great to have you here today. How are you? I'm doing great, John. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure, Lance, and let's get right to it. Why don't you tell us about yourself? How long have you been an admissions counselor, and how did you end up in such a position? Sure. Um, you know, I wasn't really expecting to be an admission counselor, I think, from, from the very start, but uh, originally I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada, so pretty far away from Williamstown, about 2,000 miles or so. Um, I, you know, I was, I was kind of a first-generation college student. I really didn't know anything about the college process, and um, you know, I was very fortunate to get some, some free college advising. I found out about Williams. I applied. Um, I, you know, I got in. And then four years later, when I was about to graduate, I, uh, you know, I saw that the admission office was, was hiring. And a lot of the work that we do, I mean, obviously, we're, we're admitting the whole class that, that applies. But you know, a lot of the work we're doing is, is really intentionally thinking about how we can really spread the word about liberal arts colleges generally, as well as Williams uh, in specific to um, to, to students of, of backgrounds, maybe wouldn't typically be able to hear about Williams. And so uh, a lot of the work that I get to do is travel the country and talk to families and students, um, their first generation, low income, um, folks that maybe have heard about Williams, maybe that haven't. And, and it's just really, honestly, really exciting to be able to talk about my alma mater in a, in a way that, um, you know, a lot of students really, I think, light up when they hear about Williams. It's, it's a small school. Not everybody has heard about it. Um, but when they do, it's, it's usually pretty exciting. And so that's what's kept me in it. I've only been in the job for one year. Um, this is my fifth year in Williamstown, but but maybe uh, you know here, here's to many more. Well, absolutely, yes. We wish you continued success, and I know that they're very lucky to have you. And I'm very interested to hear all about Williams College. So, Lance, let me ask you: What is it about Williams College that makes it so appealing for so many students to want to apply and ultimately attend? Sure, I think Williams is a, an interesting school because it is—it's a small liberal arts school. I think you know, like a lot of liberal arts colleges, you're going to get kind of—I I think the liberal arts promise, right? You have small class sizes. Our, our student-to-faculty ratio is small; it's seven to one. Our average class size is thirteen. Um, we really pride ourselves on being able to fully deliver that kind of small class experience. I think something that's unique about Williams is its its, it's location. In part, we're kind of nestled in the Berkshire mountain range, so it's really kind of gorgeous uh, place to, to live, to learn, to go to college. Um, and I think there are a few things that are unique about Williams. I'll go over kind of two uh, academic experiences that are unique to Williams and then some other things that I think we do really well. Um, one of the things we have here is called uh, a tutorial. It's a class format we have here at Williams. Um, about 10% of the classes we offer here, about 70 every uh, year are in this format, and it's basically two students, one professor for a whole semester. So it's a really, really small class, just wow. two students. Um, of course, it's a lot of responsibility for those students, right? You're half of the class, you have to be <laughs> reading, you have to show up, uh, and on all those things. But for the right students, I think it's it's a really incredible learning experience. It's tons of of work, but it's also tons of feedback. You're constantly improving and learning, um, and and it's really, I think, an interesting, very unique kind of way of approaching. Um, academia, and, and they're offered really in every department, every area of study, so students really, really enjoy them. You don't have to take them here at Williams. We, I always like to emphasize that. 
I think some students get a little intimidated by the idea of being one of three people in a room learning. <laughs> but you certainly can here at Williams. And then one of the other things that's kind of unique is a, uh, a program we have. It's a study abroad opportunity for our, our juniors. We send 26 juniors every year to uh, Oxford University for the Williams Exeter program at Oxford. So for a full year, you're a fully matriculated student at Oxford. You get to study uh, at Exeter College. Um, and you can take whatever classes you want. They're all offered in the tutorial format. So that's kind of where we stole it from, uh, you know, several decades ago. And so you know, every class you take is going to be a tutorial. You get to kind of, you know, go and be an Oxford student. We've had students run for the Oxford Student Union. You can be, you know, the captain of a sports team. It's really up to you. You're a full student. Um, and, and students really love that. It's a competitive uh, application, but it really is probably one of the best kind of Oxbridge programs uh, that you can, you can really have uh, availability for. And so a lot of our students really enjoy that. One other thing I'll just talk about briefly, because it's a, it's a huge thing that we recently were able to announce, and I think something just really exciting to, to be able to say about my alma mater, as well as just the place that I work, is that Williams has recently um, announced that it's, it's the first and, and currently only college to uh, have an all-grant initiative for, for financial aid. And so what that means is kind of twofold. We were able to announce that we are no longer offering loans as part of our uh, financial aid packages. So students won't have uh, loans factored into their financial aid. Um, but I think actually, even more importantly, uh, at least just as impactfully, um, students won't be expected to work during their time at, at college. So you won't have to have a job during the semester. You won't have to have any summer contributions. Um, you can certainly work if you want to, but you will kind of be given uh, you know, a stipend for, for personal expenses at the start of each semester. You can use that to buy tickets home, and then you're welcome to spend your time doing whatever you want, be that sleeping in, be that doing two jobs. It's, it's, it's really up to you, but we're really able to do a lot for our students who are on financial aid. Um, beyond that, you know, we cover things like textbooks and summer storage and health insurance, but that was a really exciting thing that we, we were able to, to announce recently that I think makes Williams pretty unique. Well, those are definitely unique opportunities for students in terms of the financial aid package that you mentioned, but also the fact that 26 juniors get to matriculate and attend school in Oxford. What an opportunity to not only travel abroad, but also study there. And I love that you mentioned about the small class sizes, seven to one ratio with the average class at 13, which is truly incredible. In addition to the class classes that you mentioned where there's two students and one professor where, of course, you wouldn't be able to hide in those classes. So I think that's terrific. Thank you so much for that introduction, Lance. I was curious, Lance, I know that you're located in a beautiful rural area of Massachusetts. Can you tell us about life on campus outside of the classroom? Absolutely. Uh, we are a, a rural school. Um, you know, we're in the northwest corner of Massachusetts. We're about five minutes from both Vermont and New York states. Um, you know, geographically, we're about three hours from Boston, three hours from New York City. Um, so regularly, students will kind of do day trips and weekend getaways to, to those cities, but on campus, there are plenty of things going on as well. You know, extracurricularly, there are over 120 student groups. It's very easy to start them here at Williams. Um, we have uh, loads of acapella groups, I think eight in total. We have about 30% of our student body uh, are recruited athletes, about 20% more uh, engage in club sports. So there's always a sport game going on. Um, plenty of our students really, you know, we have a lot of school pride. Our mascot is Ophelia, the purple cow. And I think uh, as quirky as that is, we, we really enjoy, um, you know, going to, to sports games. We happen to be just pretty good at sports in general. So I think that's a, a huge kind of cornerstone and just things folks like to do on the weekends. Um, and I think outside of, you know, of course, clubs and, and, and whatever uh, ways students fill their time, there's tons of things going on in Williamstown throughout the year. Um, like I said earlier, we're in the Berkshires. And so it's really a gorgeous place to uh, come and vacation in the fall when, you know, the, the fall uh, leaves are changing. And so I feel like there's just constant streams of tourists and, and folks you can meet and run into in kind of our town center. During the summer, there's the Williamstown Theater Festival. Um, year round, there's, there's faculty members and artists and performances and just all sorts of outside things going on, uh, both in town and, and really close to us. Uh, we're kind of fortunately in this really artsy hub of, of the, uh, the Berkshire um, region. We have three art museums within really 12 minutes of our campus. Um, and kind of juxtaposed, we have, you know, our, our nearest Starbucks is 30 minutes away, right? So it's a really artsy <laughs> campus. Uh, it, is, it is a rural school, but there's always something to go, you know, go to and, and enjoy uh, here at Williams. 
Well, I've been in the area many times and it is absolutely beautiful. I used to love to visit it with my wife and my daughters when they were much smaller. But uh, let me ask you the next question here, Lance, which is how many applications do you review a year and can you walk us through the process of how you evaluate them? Are you in a team? Is it individual? Any insight that you could give would be greatly appreciated. Definitely. Um, you know, the application pool has been increasing um, the last few years. Uh, this past year, we received just over 15,000 applications, which is uh, qu quite a few. Um, we, we have a, a fairly small team, but we certainly, you know, in no ways allow that to uh, diminish the amount of, of time and attention we put into our application review process. Um, I myself probably reviewed a, a thousand to two thousand. Um, I think that's probably wow. the case for, for each admission counselor. Um, in our office, we, we read for you know quite quite a while. That's why it takes so long to get your decision back. Uh, we really are intentional about reading our, our all of our applications and, and really every word of them. And the way we do it is is kind of not necessarily just unique to Williams, but it, every school is going to be a little bit different. The way we do it at Williams is that every application that comes through the door is going to be read by two admission counselors simultaneously. So we'll get into a room, we'll get into a Zoom call. Uh, we'll read an application. We will take notes and talk. We will discuss the kind of things we're noticing as we're reading them. Um, and with those notes, eventually after we've read really the entire applicant pool, we come together in what we call a committee, which is made up of all of the admission counselors in our office. And in committee, we review notes. Uh, you know, we make the tough decisions. Um, you know, we're very fortunate to have so many applications, but of course we are unfortunate and we only have a, a finite amount of, of beds that we can fill. And so, um, I always just like to say that we, we have to turn away a lot of really, really qualified students. It's not like if you don't get in, you're not a, a you know really incredible applicant. Um, but that's our process, you know, and then we, we, we discuss in that way in committee, we make the hard calls and we build a class. Um, you said also, you know, do we read uh, regionally or are we assigned regions? And, and we certainly are. So I'm assigned kind of a variety of different regions. Um, each person in my office is, and if you're curious, if whoever's listening, um, you know, what what regions uh, you know you might fall into? Um, I'm the the regional rep for Long Island, so um, you can always reach out to me. But um, there there are a variety of other regions that are represented, of course, as well. And each person will be the kind of the primary, um, at least spokesperson liaison between Williams and that region for any kind of questions that students might have from them. Well, we appreciate that, Lance. And I was curious, what are the different ways that a student may apply to Williams? Early action, early decision, regular decision. And are there any advantages from applying one way over the others? It's a great question. And it's, it's a question that I recommend students ask uh, at any school that they're considering applying early or, or just applying to in general. I think it's always good to have this information. Um, at a really kind of high level, Williams for this current, this, this coming application cycle will be accepting two forms of applications. So we'll be accepting the common application as well as the QuestBridge application. So students can apply with either. We have no preference. And we do have two decision rounds. So we have a regular decision round, like most schools do. Um, the deadline there is going to be early January. And then we also have an early decision round, which is uh, a binding early round that students can apply to. If they get in, they're committed to coming to Williams. Um, and really the kind of the benefit there is you get to find out earlier, you get to submit your application earlier, and you really just get to be done earlier, which I think um, can't really be understated in a, in a process as stressful as the college admission process. A question I would always recommend asking a school you're considering applying early to is whether or not you have a benefit conferred to you by way of applying early. And at Williams, we do not give explicit benefit to early applicants. Um, and that's really important because, you know, sometimes students are going to ask, and I do get these types of questions, you know, should I apply early or should I apply regular? And usually, I mean, unless, unless there's a really strong urge, if you think your, your application is completely fi finished, there's no benefit in waiting a little bit longer. Sure, you're, you're welcome to apply early. It's always awesome, I think, to see students that are excited to uh, come to Williams. They, they know Williams is their top choice. But you know, if you think that a few extra months will give you some time to revise your essays or pull up a grade or anything else, I think there's really no harm in waiting. Um, you're not going to get a, a better chance um, early, and, and it really is up to you. But um, it, it is a big decision, I think, applying in a binding way to a college and just you know use use your kind of your your responsible judgment in that way. Well, those are great pieces of advice. Lance, I was curious, if a student falls a little lower than your current freshman class average in terms of academics, what are some of the things that they can do to enhance their overall application? So I always like to say there are no average applicants. You know, as much as we talk about <laughs> averages, um, every applicant is, is unique. And part of the way that we read in partners, um, you know, just really the way that we're 
approaching the admission process is always looking for reasons to include a student or never looking for reasons to deny or exclude a student. And for that reason, you know, I just I just like to note that you know we're not we're not ever looking at kind of a scorecard with with averages we're trying to hit or admission percentages we're trying to reach. But that being said, of course, I mean some students are going to have relative weaknesses in their application. That's that's how it works, right? Um, it's always helpful, I think, if you know that you know you're going to fall below a GPA average um, or or a testing average. Um, you can try to study uh, study more for the test, retake it. Um, sometimes you have the ability to pull up grades. That's always something you should consider. But I think just in general, uh, I would always recommend applying to a balanced college list in, in the first place. So, and of course, Williams is going to be a reach school for a lot of students. And so just applying in a balanced way um, and just in general, focus on the aspects of your college application that you can change. So if you feel like your grade is kind of set in stone, you feel like your tests are really something that are immovable or, or you're planning on applying without tests, you know, work on your essay, um, work on really polishing the, the rest of your application. And of course, I, I think just the last thing I would say is if there is ex, you know, extra information you think that would be helpful for us to know about why a certain grade is the way it is or about why you know, a test looks the way it is um, on your application, I think it's always useful to use the additional information section to just give us some more context. Um, really in the, kind of the, the time that we get to read an application, we're trying to meet the person on the other side. And so whatever additional context we have is, is always useful. Well, we appreciate that insight, of course, Lance. And I was curious, does Williams College accept AP, IB, or dual enrollment classes for credit? So we don't accept those for credit, but we do certainly look at them in the application review process. Um, and so what I mean by that is, you know, if you have taken a, a load of AP classes or IB classes in high school, if you were to be admitted, those classes will be taken and considered when you're being placed into your introductory classes. So if you've taken the equivalent of you know, English 101, then maybe you'll be placed into English 201, for instance. But at Williams, every student is going to be required to take 32 courses before they graduate, at least 32 courses. And so you won't be able to test out of one of those courses and, and only take 31 before you graduate. Um, but certainly in the admission process, we are constantly looking at the classes that are offered to students, the amount of classes that they take. So some schools don't have AP or IB curriculum, so some students can't take those things. And we certainly aren't going to hold that against a student if they haven't taken a class that wasn't offered to them. But within whatever context that we have, it's always helpful to know that a student is challenging themselves, taking the most rigorous classes, and then hopefully doing well in them. And so we'll certainly consider things like IB and AP, honors classes, or whatever kind of advanced level courses a school may offer. But I always just like to underscore the fact that if your school doesn't offer any kind of advanced courses, you're not at a disadvantage. We're going to recognize that from your application, uh, and we'll, we'll calibrate that to the context that we were able to glean. Well, we appreciate that explanation. And I was also curious, Lance, do you use the student's high school GPA as indicated on their transcript, or do you recalculate using your own metrics? If so, could you just give us any insight on that, please? So when we're looking at a student's transcript, we are always going to be looking at just their GPA. We're not going to recalculate it behind the scenes. And this is going to vary school to school, of course. But uh, at Williams, we, we really just use whatever is given to us from the school, from the transcript. And again, like I said earlier, you know, we're always going to be looking at the context of that school. And so sometimes a student might have a GPA out of 12, sometimes out of 100, sometimes out of four. Sometimes there are weighted GPAs, unweighted GPAs. It's really going to depend on the school. It's going to depend on what classes were offered, what was taken, um, and, and just how well a student did in those courses. And so we're always going to try and gain the most context we can in, that, in those cases, but we're never going to recalculate them. Really, we're just going to kind of try and get a sense of, with whatever opportunities were given, how well did you do? How well did you use those opportunities? Understood, Lance. And a student's activity sheet is another piece, of course, of their overall application. What are some of the kinds of things you're looking for beyond the work that they did in the classroom? This is a really great question, something that I feel like I get pretty often, which is, you know, what are we looking for in the application generally, but also, especially with extracurriculars, what are we looking for? Just today, actually, I had a student who asked, you know, are we looking for well-rounded students? Are we looking for students with a, a spike, I guess, is, is what some folks call it. Um, <laughs> and the answer really is that we're just looking that students are spending their time outside of the classroom in ways that are interesting to them, in ways that are engaging, productive. And, you know, in some ways, I think there are areas we like to see students spend time. We like to see that students are academically uh, engaged and, of course, intellectually curious. But that isn't to say that all of your extracurriculars need to be academic in nature. Um, indeed, none of them have to be at all. Really, what we're looking for is that students are just spending their time on something. And so, of course, there are some students who have seemingly unlimited time. They're president of every club. 
And that's certainly going to be a profile of a student. It's, it's helpful to know that a student is a go-getter, they're a leader, they have plenty of, of interests and all of the time in the world to pursue them. On the other hand, sometimes students are only interested in one thing, be that a sport, be that the, you know, the newspaper at their school, maybe it's speech and debate. And that's also totally fine. Um, you know, some students, I guess, would call the first well-rounded and the, the latter a spiky student. What we look at is just two students, right? And we try to get a sense of, with the totality of the application in a holistic manner, what is that student interested in? What are their kind of their themes? Why are they wanting to go to college? And how does their extracurricular uh, time commitment kind of go into that story? Um, the one thing I will note, which is, you know, I think when students think about extracurriculars, they often think about clubs, they think about sports teams, they think about, you know, orchestra or choir, and all of these things are certainly extracurricular. But I, I would hesitate to say that those are the only extracurriculars that exist. There are obviously a host of other ways you can spend your time outside of the classroom. Um, work is an extracurricular, right? Family responsibilities is an extracurricular. And I encourage students to list those as well. Um, you know, it's just always helpful to know what students are spending their time doing. It's never going to be a penalty for students if they, um, you know, can't be on the newspaper or on the track team because they have to work. That's just another thing that is helpful to know. Um, and if they ever feel, if students ever feel like they can't get all the information across that they need in the extracurricular section, about the QuestBridge application or the Common App, um, I really encourage them to use the additional information section to provide that context to us. Well, that's great advice. We really appreciate that. And of course, the college essay is another piece of the application. Lance, what are some examples of college essays that really stuck with you? In other words, when you read it, you thought, this student really needs to attend Williams College. It's also a really great question. I think there's a lot of anxiety around the college essay and just kind of what to say, what not to say, how to do it well. Um, I think if you Google, you know, college essays that work, there are thousands of quote unquote essays that worked for students. Um, and I, I hesitate to speak too much into that narrative that there are essays that work or topics that work. Um, but I can give some general good advice that I recommend students internalize and consider when they're writing their essay. Um, the first one I would just say is that there really are no dull topics. There's only dull treatments. And so you know, some of the best essays that I've read have been about things that, I mean, I can't even remember the topic. They're the things that have fleeting interest for probably even the person writing them. Um, and, and I think that's important because I think sometimes students will sit down and they will say, I have nothing to write. I have nothing to say. And I think that when you say that, you're kind of putting yourself in my shoes, right? The admission counselor, like I have nothing to say that is interesting to another person. And I think that's the wrong way to take it because you, you really don't know who's going to be reading the essay. And if you're, you know, trying to appeal an admission counselor, maybe it'll appeal one, you know, appeal to one, but not to the other. And so I think it's kind of a fraught exercise. So I really just recommend writing something that is true to you in an authentic voice, in a tone that you know how to use. You know, don't try to be funny if you're not a funny writer. Don't try to be serious if you are, you know, a naturally jovial person. Um, and in the end, really just just focus on something that you want to say, some story you want to get out. Um, it doesn't have to be how you save the world. It can be about you know, your love for a certain type of sandwich, uh, about, you know, your, your love for saltine crackers. I mean, you know, you, you can really <laughs> find some of the most bizarre essay topics and, and, you know, the, the ones that quote unquote work, rarely it's because the topic is revolutionary. It's very often because the treatment is unique and authentic. And those are the ones that are going to stick with me, um, the most, and those are certainly the ones that have stuck with me to this point. Lance, do you have examples of a college essay that stuck with you, but for the wrong reasons? In other words, an essay that didn't add much to the student's overall application? Definitely. I, I, think, I think, again, you know, in a similarly dodging kind of way, I do want to just say some general things, general tropes that I noticed that certainly stick with me. Um, and and I, I pulled my colleagues and they, they agree. So I think this is hopefully helpful. Um, but it is very easy to tell when a student is using a thesaurus when they're writing their, their essay. Um, I think, you know, very often, again, there's this kind of assumption that if they sound smart, if students sound smart, if they can really play up this, you know, intellectual academic vibe, that, that'll help them in the college process. And I really, really hesitate to recommend that for students because very often, if you're writing in a tone of voice you don't know how to use or, you know, just a, a, a way of writing that you usually don't employ, it's not going to end very well. So you know, don't use big words you don't understand. Really, truly just write the way you know how to do. Um, that's going to be the most authentic voice. It's going to be the one that flows the most easily. And it's going to be, at the end of the day, a more pleasurable experience to read that essay for, for us, for yourself, for your friends and family who are going to proofread it. So definitely put away the thesaurus uh, while you're writing that essay. Um, the only other thing I, I will say is, 
it's really helpful when the essay that you're writing is about you. So sometimes I read essays that are about role models or you know, heroes in your life. It might be a grandmother, it might be a father, it might be you know, a teacher or a priest or a pastor, whatever. I mean, there's a, any number of heroes or role models. And very often at the end of these essays, I kind of come away wanting to admit the person that was wrote about um, and, and really not finding much about the, the author of that paper that essay. So I just recommend about anything that you write about, no matter what the topic is, just make sure it's centrally about yourself. And that if you were to take yourself out of it, it wouldn't make any sense, right? It has to be about you and only you. Um, and it can certainly be a, you know, it can certainly mention and talk about other folks and use them as, as, as kind of vehicles towards expressing who you are. Um, but, but make sure that it is something that will uniquely identify you and, and tell the admission counselor on the other side about you. Well, we really appreciate the thorough answers on both questions related to the college essays. Thank you so much, Lance. And do you offer any supports for students that may have had an IEP or 504 in high school? And if so, can you explain? Definitely. So once students are admitted and they decide to matriculate to Williams, um, if you require any kind of assistance or if you've had an IEP in the past or um, any kind of transition support or academic support you're going to need as a student at Williams, you can reach out to the office of accessible education. And I think, you know, one of the nice things about being a small school, um, this is not just a Williams specific thing, but just small schools in general, I think really can, can regularly offer bespoke responses and plans to students that will support them and whatever unique kind of needs they have. And, you know, I, I do want to note that um, having an IEP or any kind of academic assistance in high school does not necess like necessitate or guarantee a specific kind of treatment. Uh, in college, but certainly, um, certainly supports are, are, are here if you need them. Um, and the Office of Accessible Education um, and GL Wallace, who is the um, current director of it, um, they're, they're really incredible. They, they are obviously student service facing and they, they can really work with you in a variety of ways to, to help you through. We appreciate that, Lance. And what about students aspiring to play sports in college? What advice do you have for prospective student athletes in terms of making their intentions to play known? Like I said earlier, John, about 30% of our student body are recruited athletes and 20%, uh, you know, in addition to that, are playing club sports. Um, for that 30%, the recruited athletes, folks that think that they are, are good enough, they want to be recruited um, onto a sports team and play at Williams, um, we're a Division three school. Um, the kind of first step is to reach out to that coach for the sport that you're interested in playing for and being recruited for. Uh, the coach will be able to kind of walk you through the timeline and the process and request the you know, necessary um, really requirements and, and all of the things that, that they'll need to make that decision and kind of move you forward. Um, and, and really the coach will kind of be the liaison with the admission office whenever that time comes. Um, I will also say though, you know, we have plenty of students who apply to Williams and are not recruited, but they're interested in potentially playing sports in college, um, potentially even as a, you know, a varsity division three athlete, um, but just choose to apply without being recruited to a specific team. That's totally fine as well. Of course, we will consider your, your you know, ath athletic uh, commitment as part of your extracurricular uh, engagement. And, and that'll you know, certainly help you in the same way any kind of extracurricular engagement does. Um, and then if you are admitted, you're, you're more than welcome to, for, for most sports teams here at Williams, to try out and to walk on. And of course, if you're not interested in, in having that big of a time commitment, there are certainly plenty of club sports uh, you can you know, try out for and, and, and uh, join just the same. Um, so, you know, there, there's plenty of opportunities to stay athletic and to play sports and to, to really enjoy your time here at Williams. Well, again, Lance, we appreciate the comprehensive response. And in conclusion, what are the top three pieces of advice you would give a student and their parents who are getting ready for the college admissions process? It's a hard question because it's very open-ended, uh, but I think that it's, it's a good question because there is a lot of advice out there, um, and, and hopefully I can highlight some advice that I, I at least wish I had known kind of going into this. Um, and it, it just hopefully some advice that's it's at least time tested for, for a little bit. Uh, I think the first thing is do not underestimate fit in the college process. You know, I, I, I recommend all students out there apply to a balanced college list. And what I mean by that is, of course, there are schools that you, you know, are pretty reasonably think you can get into. You think your test scores, your GPA, all of these are kind of well above the average or the medians. Um, these are maybe your safety schools. Then, of course, there are schools you're like right at the medians or right at the averages. These are your kind of math schools. And of course, there's some schools out there that are just reaches for everyone. They're hard to get in. Um, you know, they're, they're very selective. I recommend applying to a few of each type of those schools. But I think that you should only apply to a school, only apply to a school if it's a good fit for you. So that could be a variety of different kinds 
of, of you know, metrics, but it could be, you know, an important academic fit. You know, if you want to be a veterinarian and it doesn't have a veterinarian program, maybe don't go to that school or, or figure out what kind of path there would be uh, at that school to, to do what you were interested in doing. Um, you know, is it a good social fit? Does it have the clubs you want? Is it going to support you, um, uh, you know, socially? Uh, is it going to give you the, the kind of transition support you need? All of these questions are super important, and I think they're non-negotiable. Right? A lot of the, a lot of the, the conversation is what is the admission counselor looking for in an applicant? I think actually an equal part of the conversation should be what is an applicant looking for in a college? And I think actually applicants, because there are so many incredible schools out there, can hold us to an even higher standard. And you really shouldn't be applying to a school you aren't thrilled to go to and ensure that you're going to be able to thrive at. Um, and so that's kind of my, my first piece of advice. My second one would be to kind of on the, the topic of the college essay. Um, really just, you know, if you're having trouble coming up with, with topics or coming up with treatments of those topics, um, I would really suggest just journaling. Write down, you know, one or two, su- one or two sentence summaries of your day, uh, of the activities you do, of things you notice. Um, and this is actually going to be a really great way to just kind of find general trends in your life, things that you notice, things that you do every day. And really, those can be the seeds that really create, I think, genuinely great college essays uh, because they're authentic. They're things you do. They're things that are clearly important to you, that you do them very regularly. Um, and and I, I think very often it's it's really when you sit down in one day and you try to write a whole essay, you really haven't kind of spent some time brainstorming and thinking about that it really becomes quite challenging. And my third piece of advice is, frankly, to just reach out to us. Um, I, I hope that at the very least, these kinds of podcasts that you're doing, and I, I really think they're they're truly awesome. I, I hope you, you keep being able to do them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope that they dispel this idea that admission counselors or mission officers are scary. Um, <laughs> not, at least I'm not. Uh, and, and I think there are a lot of questions out there that I remember having as a student uh, that I know parents and, and students have. Um, and we can answer them. And, and we, you know, we aren't we aren't tallying behind the scene every time somebody's reaching out and, and you know, we're not tracking grammar and denying students. You know, I mean, it's it's really just you can reach out, you can ask a question, we're going to give you, you know, an answer, send you hopefully, you know, in, into the right direction. And, you know, I mean, places like Williams, you know, no, no one school is, is perfect for everyone. Um, and I think that reaching out is a great way to figure out uh, which schools are. Well, those are tremendous pieces of advice, Lance. I really appreciate your time today, and I'm so happy because I know this is helping so many students and their parents. We really appreciate your insight and having you. Thank you so much, Lance. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure, and we hope to have you again, Lance. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap.